Well, if you have your Bibles, let me ask you to turn to Romans in chapter 15. Romans in chapter 15. I'm reading from the ESV. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore we'll praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him. The Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus then. I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will venture, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you. Once I have enjoyed your company um, for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bring aid to the saints for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their, in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. And therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected. I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be accepted to the saints, acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. 
Amen. Without ambition, one starts nothing. Without work, one finishes nothing. Without ambition, one starts nothing. Without work, one finishes nothing. It's a fairly popular quote out there. It's by one Ralph Waldo Emerson. Hope you're not using him for your devotions. Not a Christian. Or maybe a different quote. Might be a slightly more familiar. It's a quote from Marianne Williamson. And she says this, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask of ourselves, who am I to be brilliant or gorgeous, talented or fabulous? Actually, emphasis added, the question ought to be, who are you not to be any of those things? End of quote. Ambition. Ambition. It's the topic we're looking at today. We, we, we want to redeem it in accordance to, to, to what Paul has written here. How are you doing with ambition? Are you an ambitious person? Would you say words like this fire you up? Put a fire under you and you go like, yes, let's go do it. Let's go get it. Here's what's complicated from this passage. In some ways, this is quotes that, that kind of resonate, perhaps even with you this morning, are somewhat true. There's a way in which what those quotes are saying is, is actually what I aim to do for you today, to, to really get you where you're sitting, to, to realize that fact that, yes, we, without ambition, one starts nothing without work. Nothing actually gets finished. And for you to actually arise and awake and get busy, get dreaming, get attempting big things for God, and praying for big things for God and expecting big things from God. It's a quote by William Carey. Carey. And yet in another way, th those quotes are exactly what is wrong with ambition. Th th those quotes are exactly what is actually humming the church and keeping us as, as a congregation from attaining to the work that we have been called to. The, the joy of the nations is what is at stake when we are speaking about redeeming ambition in the church. Where ambition in the church has been corrupted, poisoned, corroded with something earthly and worldly we will not be able to live the way in which Paul is calling us to live in this particular section. Or where ambition is completely missing and lacking in this church, we will likewise not be able to live up to the calling that our God has given to us to see the gospel advance. So here's my job this morning. It's to convince us that as a church family, as a church family, EBC, we must recover gospel ambition if we are to reach the nations for Christ. As a church family, we must recover gospel ambition if we are to reach the nations for Christ. May the Lord grant grace um, as we are looking at this portion of scripture. A few points for us. The earlier ones are where the whole argument rests, and as we wrap up, you will notice it's it's simply a matter of application. Point number one, point number one, you don't get it. Hey, Pastor. It trip it's trippers come back with problems, eh? I know, I know. 
I know. I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to, um, to harm or to um, discourage. Not at all. Paul, you'll notice Paul, before he can get to chapter 15, he had a ton of heavy lifting to do in chapter 14. I mean, in chapter 14, the church is a mess. There's, there's, there's all manner of disunity in the congregation. And so before he can be able to get the, the people he's writing to in the right frame of mind, so that they are able to actually live the way God has called them to live, he first and foremost has to take a scalpel and get to work in their hearts to, to remove the tumors that have made them sick, that are keeping them from being what God has called them to be. And so this is where he has been. And so in the opening verses of chapter 15, he's making that transition from all of the arguments that he's been making about unity in chapter 14 and showing you how it is the same issue that he's dealing with when it comes to the ambition that he wants them to live towards. If we are going to rebuild this in our own hearts, if we are going to finish up or make progress in the work that God is already doing and that is evident amongst us, we, we, we need to explore in our own hearts where the mess is. Have you ever watched those movies, uh, not movies, those reality shows um, that do like total makeovers in houses? Seen those? Where they surprise a family and the family has been living in a tiny little house with 17 kids, right? Sharing one bathroom. Seen those? And first of all, the video, the video right, pans and looks at all of the, all of the problems, right? All of the problems. That's, that's what Paul is doing in this earlier section. And he needs us to understand. And notice, notice this. He's not doing that so that he can discourage us and, and he's just going to make us down on ourselves. No, it's necessary. The, 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 it's, it's like Christ by the well. You remember Christ by the well? Pastor Le Mans is going to get here soon. Like, why is he telling that woman the things he's telling her? Yes, you've had five husbands. And the one you're with is not your husband. It's like taking a knife and sticking it right in. But lovingly and graciously, so that we might heal. And here's what Paul is saying. You need to understand that it is not about you. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. What's the problem in the church? Here's how people are living. Self. Self. It's all about you. That's what's going on in the church. There is a preoccupation with self. So in chapter 14, he's been dealing with that. It's not about your rights and your knowledge and your understanding about what is acceptable and what is not. You, you, you. Instead, you're supposed to, to be captivated with a vision for life that causes you, that brings you to a point where you actually sacrifice self for the sake of others. Those are the two clear points of his rebuke. He confronts their self-centeredness with that phrase. Not to please ourselves. Oh, 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 Pastor Ken and everyone else will preach. Notice how Paul is weaving himself in that very statement. You seeing that? Not to please who? Us, us. It's not us, right? Ourselves. This is, since this is not how we are called to live. Let us not live as though the, the point of life is, is you, is me. When we do that, one, the church is going to be strained in its unity. Oh, but you'll notice where he's going with this. Not only is the church going to be strained in its unity, the nations are not going to receive the gospel. Now, another way of saying it is, is the same thing that is a solution to advancing the gospel through us is the thing that is a solution to enhancing unity amongst us. 
The same thing that produces unity, gospel unity. Not a worldly kind of unity, but a gospel unity. The same that produces that is exactly the same thing that will cause us to be in a posture that will allow the gospel to advance through us. So first of all, he calls them to not please themselves. But the second, in verse 2, he calls us to please. Let each of us please his neighbor. Abandon your self-serving ways, seeking to merely please yourselves. This is where many of them are. We ought instead to live as those who have been delivered from that, uh, that, 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 that self-worship. That pursuit of self-glory. Concerned only about what is good for me and instead. With the kinds of lives that are preoccupied with how do I serve and bless others. I'll be going through this passage with a keen eye, especially on that idea. How is it that we as a congregation can redeem ambition amongst us so that we can be for the joy of the nations? So let me ask you, why is it that you do what you do? Why is it that you do what you do? What, what drives your actions? as a part of this congregation? Why do you host? Is that a good question to ask? You're hosting. Why am I hosting? Who am I hosting? Why, 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 why do you read the books you read? Why are you reading them? What's the aim? Why do you preach? It's ourselves, huh? Remember, I don't, I don't get to duck this one. What, what is your aim as you preach? The three of us who preach here. I do about 50 to 60% of the preaching here. What, what are you looking for? What, why, why do you teach Sunday school or in any other avenues for teaching? What gets you going? What What's your aim? Listen to this. This is what Paul is saying. The aim matters. Imagine that. It is not enough that you're doing what you're doing. Well, Paul wants to, to, to pour this healing balm at the heart of hearts. And he wants for the very aim that we have in what we do as a church to be not one of self-centeredness, not one of pleasing self, not one with me at the middle of it. He wants us to do what we do, having been liberated from that life of, of, of selfishness and self-centeredness, and then having our lives flow out for a different purpose, a different aim of actually seeking the edification of others. And so, and so it's useful to run that x-ray and ask, what are you aiming for in the things that you do? When we understand the gospel right, and we understand God right, it becomes clear that oftentimes it's the, it's the little things that matter. It's the small little things that matter the most. We oftentimes can think, man, I, but I preached God's word. Isn't that enough? Saints, but, but, but I left my homeland and I've, I've gone to Afghanistan to proclaim the gospel. Like, would you dare doubt me with all the sacrifices that I have made for the advancement of the gospel? And yet, and yet here he is whispering to me, yes, yes, yes. And, and yet, and yet, I want to know why. Why do you do the things that you do? Let me make a quick application to that. Here's the thing. When, when, when I do the things that I do merely for self, Take, for example, if, if I am serving other people, I am hosting you in my home so that I might be known as a hospitable person. Amen? Amen? I'm such a good guy. So that my fellow elders can, can, can not say that, you know what, Ken doesn't really host. You know, it's one of the qualifications of an elder. Must be hospitable. 
So you know what? I, I had a couple of people over on Tuesdays and Thursdays. In fact, I'm going to put my head above them and, and really host a lot. We're going to host five days a week. Right? So that I can show myself to be something that others are not. Think the Lord is pleased with that? Note this. That motivation will get you to do certain kinds of actions, but there are certain types of things that will never flow out of that. The, the realm of your ambition will be as broad as the places where your glory can emanate. And you will draw a line right there. The things that you will be preoccupied about will be only the things that are connected to yourself. That's not how we are called to live. <laughs> Godly ambition, gospel ambition doesn't work like that. Because it doesn't emanate from you. The roots of it are something completely different. Paul is saying that the infighting that's going on in the church is a problem that has implications for God's plan for the nations. The, the infighting going on in the church has implications for the joy of the nations. Ambition that has not been set free, severed from self-pleasing is ambition that will cause a lot of strife, will not promote let's do it together. Let's work together. Let's cross the finish line together. Let's win the battle. Whether it's me who fires the last shot or not, let's defeat the enemy. Let's, uh, it will not live like that. It will all be centered on whatever connects to self, and that's not what God wants for us. So, in what ways does selfish ambition show up in your own life? In what ways are you still serving self? Where externally as a church, there's so many good things that we do. And we trust that the Holy Spirit is at work in and through them. Amen. Totally. But in our making progress even more, now making progress even further. Where do we need to go back into our hearts and say, you know what? There are things going on in my heart that are all about me. There are ways in which I approach the, my life in this congregation that have less to do with the seeking for the edification of others and are a whole lot more about making up for some insecurities inside of me covering up for some inadequacies, making up even for ways in which I know I'm weak or a sinner. Instead of running to Christ and the mercy and grace that is mine there, instead I'm working super hard to have my head rise above everybody else's. You know what's funny about worldly ambition? I had this statement from a very secular person, and very is an important addition there. And they were like, if you look at some of the world's most accomplished people, some of the world's most driven people, what fires and flames that ambition and drive is oftentimes some form of insecurity. And so this is the person who has a deep sense of insecurity and the way they have sought to deal with that insecurity is I am going to accomplish some dramatic great thing that will make it clear to the whole world I am not what that little voice keeps saying in my head and so here we go I will work 24 hours a day right and I'm going to solve all of the world's problems. And I'm going to, I am, I, 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 I. And guess what, guys? It kind of works. It actually kind of works. You can build great companies and change a whole lot of things. But that is not the kind of ambition that God wants to drive his work in the church. It's not it. So if we are going to redeem ambition, it starts off there. 
Lord, search my heart and show me whether there be any wicked ways in me. Would you set me free? Would you set me free from living for myself in your name? And would you grant to me a genuine desire to seek, to aim for the edification of others? It might be that you don't struggle with ambition. You have heard those quotes before, and they all smell fishy to you. And you're like, yeah, this ambition thing. There's no way you can be ambitious and humble at the same time. And so the solution is aim for nothing. Amen? Let's just like be the kind of people who don't really aim to move the needle on anything. Why? Because I'm just humble. Well, it's good to explore that as well. Because you might be in a place where it's still self that you're serving. You're quite content with other people taking the risks, other people bearing the burdens, other people getting the work done, other people paying the bill, and you will continue to live for yourself with no ambition whatsoever, no risk-taking whatsoever, no inconveniencing of yourself whatsoever. So it's, that is the simple other side of the ditch that has the same problem, the self has gripped you. And you're still living for your self. Take a slight note of this as we are pressing on to the second point here. This passage has three separate benedictions, which I think ought to help us understand how much help we need from God if we are going to reclaim gospel ambition. See, Paul, after he's going to be finished with this first section, which we are not, is going to say, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Since if we, if we are going to be set free from self, we need God. We need God. And so Paul Preaches a little and then prays. It's kind of what a benediction is, isn't it? It's, it's an upward and, 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 and also towards the people who are listening kind of prayer. May the God towards you, right? We need his help if we're going to do this. The second benediction is, 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 is in verse 13 where he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And then the very last verse, may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. If, if we are going, if we are, if our lives are going, um, to, to, to have, to be defined with a gospel ambition, we need God to work in us. So I pray that you're praying together with me towards those ends. Tell that defensive voice to keep quiet. And let the surgeon that is the Holy Spirit do his job. Plead instead, God, work in me. Grant me the wherewithal that I need to, to turn my life away from living a self-centered life and liberate me. Grant me the power to be able to live in the ways in which you're calling me to live. Well, for us to live that way, we need to see Jesus. We need to see Jesus. That's the second point. How do we redeem gospel ambition? Come and see. See Christ. It's, it's, it's the whole point, really. The life and work of Christ will determine the very shape of our ambition and the power that fuels it. Biblical ambition is both powered by and patterned after the life of Jesus. Notice where he goes immediately there in verse 3, for Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Paul quotes from Psalm 69, 7 to 9. 
a lament of David. Here's verse 7, the context of verse 9, which Paul is quoting. For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. Listen to verse 9, the full verse. For the zeal of your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Here's what David is saying. I love you. Do you know what my zeal is towards? My zeal is towards your house. So much so that the reproaches of those who reproach you, God, have fallen on me. David is driven by one thing, a zeal for the house of the Lord. And, and, and Paul takes that verse and applies it to Jesus. This is the same thing that Jesus did. His life and work are a manifestation, if you don't so please, a, a fulfillment of what David was saying there. Here is what drove Christ. It's God. It's a zeal for his house. A work that God has intended to do to make himself a dwelling place amongst his people. And that's exactly how you'll see this passage developing. What begins all the way back in Genesis is going to be fulfilled in a, an eschatological temple made up of living stones. According to First Peter in chapter 2. That's what we are. And that dwelling place of God is going to be made up of people from every nation, every tongue, and every tribe. So that the temple that the Lord is most zealous about was not ultimately one made with stones. Its job was to point us to something greater. He is Jesus. And how did he live? He lived with the same kind of zeal, or oh, a greater zeal, than the one that David manifests there. And in his zeal to see that temple established, a people of God from every nation, reclaimed, redeemed, he endured reproach. That goal, that goal was worth Christ enduring suffering. What goal? The glory of God displayed amongst the nations. That goal. That is the zeal that drove our Lord. Because of that zeal, God's people, he endured suffering. He did not please himself. Another way of saying this, that there is a way to live, there is a thing to live for that is so much more glorious that it makes sense for you to suffer for its sake. And so what Paul wants us to pattern our lives after is what Christ has done himself. Look at how he has lived. He did not please himself. What did he seek instead? He sought to see people from every nation, tongue, and tribe. That's going to be fleshed out even more in verse 6. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Why did Christ suffer? So that God's promises to Abraham, that through him all of the nations of the earth will be blessed, would be brought to pass. It's the same thing that he's aiming after. That's what Christ did in his life and in his death. What was the goal? What was the goal? The nations, that all of God's elect Jews and Gentiles will be brought in. That was the reason why Christ lived the life that he lived and died the death that he died. So that God might be glorified amongst the nations. David's zeal for God's house was a small little zeal. And yet it was a zeal for God's house that made him say, I am willing to suffer for that. Christ's zeal is the ultimate zeal. To see the nations brought in, Jews and Gentiles. And he was willing to suffer for that. 
Saints, would you see here that the way in which the Lord paid for your self-centeredness was by living a life that was exactly the opposite of that. That you were delivered from the penalty of sin because Jesus Christ lived not to please himself. That's what Paul is doing with us. So that as you're beginning here, it's good for you to realize that the, that the solution to your self-centeredness was, was in a Christ who did the exact opposite on the cross. Look at your salvation. He suffered for your sake. He aimed for your edification at his own expense. He was cut off so that he would not be cut off. So that's where we take our self-centeredness this very morning. That's where we take our selfishness this very morning. That's where we take that poison that has corrupted, that is threatening to corrupt the purity of life that the Lord has granted to us. And we rejoice in the fact that you made atonement for this on the cross. Thank you that you have saved me with a perfect righteousness of a selflessness that I clearly even now do not manifest or demonstrate. But realize that Paul isn't only pointing to that reality that yes, yes, our sins have been forgiven. We, we have been delivered from that way of living. He is showing us that we actually can live like this because that is how Christ has lived. The life that is in us is the life of Christ. The life that is in us, Christ's own life, is a life that endured suffering, that endured reproaches. So I know that I do not need to live a life that is enslaved to pettiness and pride that takes all things personally. I don't need to live like that. You know why? Not only because I have been saved from that, I've been forgiven of that. But the power of that, which drives the rest of the world, has been broken in me. I actually can live like Christ. Because it is its life that is in me. A life of loving other people. A life of serving other people. A life of enduring reproaches from other people for their own good. A life that can get to the point where I speak just like Stephen did, echoing the very words of Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. As they're stoning him. What in the universe is that? It's like Jesus himself speaking through the man, isn't it? This is who we are as a church. So we look at Christ and we know that, yes, all our selfishness, self-centeredness, selfish ambition, pride, Self-glory, all of that was atoned for on the cross. The power, because it is a powerful thing. You feel it inside you? You must feel it inside you. Oh my goodness, I feel it inside me. That power doesn't have to rule me anymore. I can look at it and say, no, no, no. That's the old man. He was put to death on the cross. I don't live like that anymore. I don't have to quit ministry because somebody said a coward about my sermon after I preached it. Someone suspected my two motives and said, hey, by the way, Pastor Ken, you know, da, da, da. Oh, I'm done. Guys, can't do this anymore. I can endure that. I can take the shot. No, don't shoot me though. <laughs> What's encouraging you? To have me for your lunch today. <laughs> but because of what Christ has done, I am able. I am able to actually live a life where I endure suffering as I teach you with patience and gentleness. So that the way in which we do ministry is we don't just do ministry with the people in this church who really like us and really affirm us. And really say, Pastor, I really agree with you. And the people who kind of look at us, look down upon us, we don't love or serve or pursue. Uh -uh. You see how ministry will look like from our part as your elders? 
Empowered by Christ, we are able to love all of you and endure the necessary reproaches that it will take to pursue your edification to the last man, to the ones who call us names, accuse and say on, we will be able to do that only if we live lives that are patterned after and empowered by the life of Christ. Notice as well that this ambition leaves out the effectual service that Christ rendered. You see what Christ's life accomplished? There's two in order that's. Are you seeing them? And then a whole lot of quotes from the Bible. Why did Christ become a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm Confirm. Christ lived and died so that everything that God said to Abraham, Jew and Gentile will be confirmed, will be brought about. And specifically, so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So, so godly ambition is very different. Gospel ambition is very different from worldly ambition. Worldly ambition is kind of startup mode. Eh? Startup mode. It's, it's, I have an idea. By the way, I have an idea. I want to create something out of nothing. Right? Uber. Airbnb. I have an idea. That's what gospel ambition Gospel ambition instead is, ah, uh, actually God had the idea in eternity past, point number one. Point number two, God accomplished the idea through Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. Because what his life, death, and resurrection accomplished is the purchasing of the elect from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Christ died for his bride. It is Finished. Job is accomplished. The eschatological temple will be built and it will be glorious. Those whom God has appointed unto salvation will be saved. If you have any doubts towards those ends, look back to the resurrection. He rose from the grave. Nothing can stop him. Gospel ambition seeks the manifestation of that reality. And so gospel ambition is a whole lot more like, 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 like a child coming into this world than it is like a startup company. The painful labor that it takes for a child to be born does not create the child. On that day, we know quite well that the, that the child was conceived many moons back. But for that child to come into this life, we celebrate their happy birthday, oh, it's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice, a lot of pain. And did you notice how nobody looks at a child that is born and boasts in the child? Notice that? You're not filled with this idea of, I did it. Look at the work of my creation. The same way you might be tempted to do with a startup. I know, I know, even a startup is not quite you who's done it. We know that, but shock with my illustration. You look at a child and, and you marvel at the fact that you, yes, you, have been a part of something so incredible. Because there's a sense of wonder at that reality. So it is with missions. So it is with the church plant. So it is with the work of evangelism. When you proclaim the gospel to someone and they get quickened from the dead and they are born again, what is happening is, is really what Christ already accomplished 2,000 years ago, coming into fruition right in front of you through your labor. And so this is what gospel ambition is. Go and seek that which Christ has accomplished 2,000 years ago. Because what he has accomplished 
is the joy of the nations. So then look at Paul's life and see how it is patterned right after that. See how Paul speaks of his own life? Verse 17, in Christ Jesus then I have reason. I'll step back a little bit further. Middle of verse 15. I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace that is given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed and by the power of signs and wonders and by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem to all the way around to Illyricum I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see and those who have never heard will understand. What drives you? What Christ accomplished has demarcations and boundaries. Gospel ambition looks to the same thing. Emmanuel Baptist Church, hear this. What God wants our ambition to be. He wants our ambition to be shaped and empowered and driven by what Christ Jesus accomplished on that cross. That's what we exist for. What did he accomplish? A salvation of the elect amongst all nations. What shall we aim for? A salvation of the elect amongst all nations. What shall we pray for then as a church? The salvation of the elect amongst all nations. What shall we give money towards? The salvation of the elect amongst all nations. What shall we invest people in? The salvation of the elect amongst all nations. When shall we stop and say the job is done? When all the elect amongst all nations have been saved. That's when the job shall be done. Not when our church is full. Not when we have planted a congregation in all of the eight roads in Nairobi. Not when you become famous and everybody knows you. That's what the job is done. We shall not stop until a job has been done amongst all people. So by the grace of God, he offers us a liberation from ourselves. So that we can be able to live unto him. The Moravian believers were a good example of this. It is said that um, there's two of them um, who gave themselves to the work of missions to go to an island where there was no gospel preaching allowed. It was an island that was filled with, with slaves. And so these two Moravian believers gave themselves over to be sold as slaves so that they could be admitted into the island to proclaim the gospel to those who had not yet heard. And it is said that as their boat was sailing, they turned back and they shouted to those who were yet on the shore, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. That's gospel ambition. May my name be remembered? No. May I accomplish great things so that my life does not feel insignificant anymore? No. You're a Christian already. You're an adopted son already. You, you have been welcomed in by God himself already. That, that's, the, that's the medicine for that. Once that has happened, we live for his name. We seek his fame. And we do so with the full confidence that it shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. He will receive his reward. He shall. He shall receive his reward on this continent, Africa. He shall receive his reward in this country, in the northern part of Kenya, 
in the coastal regions of, of, this, of this nation, in this city that is getting more and more secular. He shall receive his reward. And you know how we live? We live in pursuit of that. As servants. Track this passage and track all the use of that little phrase, servant. Christ was a servant towards those ends. Paul was a servant towards those ends. Gospel ambition lives in service to what Christ is doing. It's not about me. Oh, praise the Lord, it's not about me. What puny little flickering glory that is. Oh, it's all about him. And that which will happen, his, this world will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And that is what gospel ambition aims for. Do we see what God has done? Are we captivated by a vision of something greater than ourselves? Are we content to remain in the background? Even as Emmanuel Baptist Church perhaps to fade in significance as far as what is going on in this city? If that is going to be the price that needs to be paid for the gospel to make more progress here? Are we okay with ourselves as individuals being less in the limelight even, perhaps? So that we can play a different role of serving other people and encouraging other people who perhaps might be the better known ones who will go ahead of us and accomplish far more than what we ever could. Here's what Paul says. That's what we need for the gospel to advance. That's what we need for the gospel to advance. Let your heart be captured by what Jesus Christ has accomplished. Be blown away by that. And then be a happy servant in whatever capacity the Lord assigns for you in the advancement of that. Don't be passive in a way that doesn't care about that because you're just consumed by yourself. Neither make it about yourself in the way in which you're pursuing those particular ends. And saints, before you look at this brief last point, marvel at this. How do we get there? How do we grow in that? Through those little baby steps of saying, today, today, I want to live in such a way that does not live as a servant to self, but that, that, that lives as a servant to the purposes of God in this congregation, on that lawn. So Emmanuel Baptist Church members, it's been a whole week since you were with that brother or sister that you so dearly love and you're really eager to catch up with. I pray we get time to do that today, isn't it? But I'll assure you this. This morning we have friends amongst us who are so happy they're here with us who don't know the Lord as Savior. And they've come. They've sung together with us. They've listened to our prayers. They've even heard this gospel message being proclaimed. And it'll be so good for you to stop them and get to know them. Ask them their names and where they're from. And perhaps offer to explain the gospel to them even in the days to come. And that might cost you a little bit, isn't it? Because as 99% of VBC people claim, you might be an introvert. This is our number one excuse for not advancing the gospel. And I'm shy. And there's two ways to live. This afternoon, on the lawn, you can live consumed with a passion of the purposes that God has for the people in this building today. You could live like that. And let me tell you how you could live like that. Let me tell you. When the bell rings, which is a piano playing, you could rise up and stretch, because it was a long sermon today, again. And say, bolt. Or just find Nani and start chatting. Or maybe get to the line of the food before it gets too long. <laughs> or you might 
Turn to the person sitting next to you or behind you or in front of you who you don't know. I assure you there's someone sitting around you who you don't know. And you could do this. You could pursue the purposes of God in their life. You could love them by being kind. That might be all you do, you hyper-intentional people. By just simply being kind and asking how is the service and where are you from and have a great afternoon. You could take a step farther and ask if they're a Christian and ask what they mean by that and see if it is the same thing as what you know is taught in the scriptures. Or you could ask them if they're a member and then be embarrassed as oftentimes we are by saying, I've been a member for two years in this church. And say, oops. And say, I'm really sorry for that. I don't know you. Do you come every Sunday? Do you know people in this church? Come over. Let me introduce to someone else who you don't know. You, 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 you could pursue the purposes of God right here in this congregation on the lawn by looking at who is not talking to anyone. Because you, you're plugged in. Eh? I know you. You know who I'm talking to. You, you're plugged in and you're Mr. or Miss Popular and everybody talks to you. Do you know there's members of this church who nobody talks to? No one talks to them. At all. They leave Sunday every single week. And no one talks to them. Some people sometimes just share some little quick hi, hi, bye, bye, superficial stuff and off they go. But no one actually has meaningfully engaged them in conversation. That happens every single Sunday. We could, as a congregation, make progress in living in pursuit of God's purposes right here at Emmanuel Baptist Church by putting ourselves last. And living out the life that is actually in us, the life of Christ who did not please himself, but sought our profit and sought our benefit. And you know what? It might take some little sacrifices that many people might not see for you to do that today. In fact, you might go today and eat your tongue. And it becomes very awkward. I don't want you to walk away saying, see, this is why I don't do this. Enduring a little awkwardness for the sake of demonstrating love and care and welcoming other people is a small price to pay, isn't it? Compared to the way in which Christ lived. You know, we could do that by cultivating just a mentality that always asks the question, always asks the question, how will what I do impact other people? You could always ask that question. How will my, my attitude, my form of speech, my choices in life affect other people? Will it promote their edification? And just seek to grow in that. Where I park, where I sit on a Sunday morning service. I mean, there's times when you'll find the rows are filled up only on the edges. Imagine this is someone's application. And I'm quite happy for everybody else to come and jump over my legs. Small thing, isn't it? I still remember a time I was rebuked like that by a pastor. And it was a Thursday early morning meeting and I was sitting right on the edge and everything else was open on, on the side. And the pastor looked at me and mocked me as is his ways of encouragement and discipleship. I was like, Ken, how thoughtful of you today to sit on the edge of the row with all of the other seats next to you empty. How kind to not consider that everybody will have to jump over your legs to be able to get to those empty seats. And it took me about three days to realize, oh, it was not encouragement. <laughs> it was actually a rebuke. I have sought since that day to sit in the middle, even when I awkwardly have to step out from the middle and inconvenience, inconvenience everybody else as I come to the pulpit. What's the point? What does Paul want us to do? Paul wants us to cultivate as a congregation a mentality of this, not about me. It's not about me. Church, can we say it together? Can we say it loudly? Can we say it together? It's not about me. 
Would you pray that for Ken? But I know that the gospel advancing through Ken's life this morning means that he needs to fall out of love with himself, with the pursuit of his own glory. That he needs to be gripped and captivated by a vision of something bigger than himself. What you have accomplished that will bring about your glory amongst all nations. Help him be a servant towards those ends. Whatever it takes this morning. I really appreciate it if you pray for me like that regularly. You know, the last point is Paul invites them to join him in that kind of life. In multiple ways. Do you see that? Multiple ways. Richie does that. I'm going to go to Spain. I want you to come in. It's not just his own plan and his own commission. What Christ accomplished produced unity. Due Gentile unity. And that kind of unity is what drives gospel ambition. Starts off at home in the way in which they live. But it's even demonstrated in the way in which the Gentiles are giving towards the Jews. It, I marvel at how all of Paul's actions are as, as, as an implication of the gospel message. What is the gospel? Something that belongs to the Jews into which the Gentiles have been welcomed in. Implication? The Gentiles ought to demonstrate that unity by giving to those whom they benefited from. What about you as a congregation? Christ did not please himself. He endured reproaches from others for the sake of God's name. Implication? You ought to live the same way and welcome one another. Together, 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 together. That is the opposite of that problem, which is self-centeredness. Desire to get across the finish line together. ABC members, let's look around and say, guys, we can do this. It's a church plant. Let's do this together. We'll send some and we'll keep some. But we will pray for them. We will finance them. We will do this together. That is not North Point's plan or Omurocho's idea or no. Everything we're doing, we're trying to do it together. What level of together? Together as a local church. Oh, but together even with other local churches, with other believers. You will see that little flavor of, of gospel unity and gospel ambition in the way in which it seeks to bring others into that which it is doing. Because it is not about me. It is not even about us as a church. And so in that opening benediction, Paul gives us our little ambition, doesn't he? May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we ought to desire. Paul has addressed the problem of self-centeredness. He has exalted Christ and the work that he accomplished on the cross. And then he lastly invites them and welcomes them to live just like him for the same ends and for the same goals. So last point of application, let me ask you this. What is your hope? What is your hope? Do you see the great and glorious hope that you have? The great and glorious hope that you have is not that your name will be exalted or my name will be exalted. The great and glorious hope that we have is that that which Christ has done will indeed be successful. The nations will be gathered as it says and shows us in Revelation 5 and Revelation 7. And there will be a throng gathered there of people from every nation, tongue and tribe. And Paul wants that hope, that hope to be in your hearts. That's the hope he wants to be in your heart. Is that the hope in your heart? Oh, I trust it's the hope that is in your heart. Fan that hope to flame. Embrace the fact that any other hopes you have are puny. Don't live for them. 
live for this great and glorious hope. If you're not a Christian and you're here with us today, I, if, if nobody talks to you, please forgive us. Please forgive us. We're still a growing church. But our hope for you is that you would come to know this Christ who lived and died for us. The one whose name we sing, the one to whom we pray, the one who we, we seek to, 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 to see his fame and his name spread throughout the nations. He is one who put his own needs last for the sake of sinners just like you. He suffered on the cross so that you could be forgiven. And we pray that this very morning you will not depart from this place still not knowing him, but that you will see one who has pursued you at his own expense and know that today your sins can be forgiven. If you are a sinner, we urge you to turn away from your sins, your self-centeredness, your selfishness, which I'm sure you, I hope, you can see all of the, the pain and and, and stress and strain in relationships it has produced. And that you'd see that as your problem, that you're living merely for yourself. You are not designed to live for yourself. I pray that you will be turned away from yourself this very morning and see him who lived and died for you and that you'd find your salvation and your forgiveness in him. Our Father, we plead with you that you would empower this, um, this message in the hearts of those who are hearing even now. That those who don't know you as Lord would even today call upon you because Christ died on the cross for them. That that which he accomplished, which will bring about the Gentiles glorifying you. Lord, would you let that be manifested even today in this very service? That one of those Gentiles might glorify you. They might be turned away from their sin and place their faith in Jesus. We pray for the rest of us as a congregation that you might cause us to grow in a selflessness. That we would more and more put on display the life of Christ that is in us. And that we would less and less look like what we used to be when we merely lived for ourselves. Would you allow this to lead to the gospel spreading right here today on the lawn? Um, in our homes all week long um, and amongst the nations as we send out workers, as we partner with other churches um, to see that the name of Christ is proclaimed where it has not yet been mentioned. In your son's name we pray. Amen.